Okay. Uh, right. Um, files. No. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust in partnership with the British Dyslexia Association. I am Maria Vizitiu and I'm Member Engagement and Events Officer at the ISM and I'm joined by our speakers for today's webinar, Soprano Anna Devon and Sally Daunt, Chair of the Music Committee for the British Dyslexia Association. Before we begin, sorry, I just have a few points for you. You should be able to see us and the PowerPoint presentation displayed on your screen but we can't see you or hear you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound quality, please let us know in the questions box and we'll make attempts to resolve the issue. If you think of any questions during the webinar, please also let us know in the Q&A box and we'll leave some time at the end to answer as many of them as possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at the ism.org forward slash webinars. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Sally and Anna, and I hope you enjoy. Well, thanks very much, Maria. Um, Anna and I are really grateful to the ISN Trust for inviting us to do this webinar. Um, so a brief introduction. Um, I'm not going to talk for very long, I can assure you. Uh, my name's Sally Daunt, and I'm chair of the British Dyslexia Association's Music Committee. Um, and I've already forgotten to do the slides. Um, and uh, <laughs> the committee, here is a, an image of thinking outside the box, which will be a sort of light motif during today. The committee is an organization which is over 30 years old and which we believe may be the only one of its kind in the world. Our key aim is to help all individuals, both teachers, performers, students, parents, and so on, to achieve in music and to do that whether or not the individual is neurodiverse in any way. And I'll explain that term in a few more moments. So the focus of this afternoon's webinar is some personal thoughts from the international opera singer Anna Devin. Not only is she a highly successful professional musician, but she's also dyslexic and happy to share that information, which actually isn't always the case. Indeed, Anna is an amb ambassador for the BDA. Even better, she's happy to share some insights today into ways in which this difference affects her as a musician. We're really delighted that Anna's agreed to help the ISM, the BDA, and we hope many musicians far and wide, both performers and teachers. So, Anna, welcome, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. Um, a quick thank you to the ISM and the BDA for having me um, here today. It's a great honour to be asked to share my thoughts on uh, dyslexia and my experience of it. Um, so I'm a Dublin-born Irish soprano. Um, I've lived in the UK for 13 years and I've trained in both Ireland in the Royal Irish Academy of Music and in the UK in the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, the National Opera Studio and um, in Covent Garden at the Young Artists Programme, the Yetta Parker Young Artists Programme. Um, I left the Yetta Parker Young Artists Programme in 2012, so I suppose my career proper, as you would say, started in 2012. Um, so I've been out singing for eight years. Um, I've sung all over Europe, mostly, and I've also been to Australia and the States. I've sung in Carnegie Hall, uh, La Scala, Milan, uh, Royal Opera House in Covent Garden and uh, the Royal Albert Hall, which many people will know who aren't necessarily as if they with the operatic um, venues. So um, I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was six years old um, with great thanks to my mum and actually to my sister. So my, I'm two years younger than my sister um, and she uh, is a huge bookworm and absolutely loves literature and reading and writing and has no issues with any of these things. She's, it's a real forte of hers. Um, so when uh, my mom was bringing us up, my sister obviously went to school and had no trouble reading or writing. It, she just took it all in her stride. So I came along, I started school and all of a sudden my mom thought, okay, why is Anna not understanding these concepts um, as my sister did? So she immediately started questioning it because she understood that we were probably, you know, on a par intellectually and um, couldn't understand why I wasn't grasping the same concepts. 
so luckily for me my mother is um, a very inquisitive person um, and she also is a massive bookworm um, so she investigated and I got tested when I was six years old by the Irish Dyslexia Association and um, it actually is funnily enough one of my early earliest memories is going to have that test done because I suppose when you're a child most of your life is going to school every day um, so the big events in your life which for me was going to be tested by the Irish Dyslexia Association um, and we did all these you know memory tests and I remember lots of pictures and these kind of things so they diagnosed me and actually was severely dyslexic um, at the age of six um, yeah so um, that's where my journey started with dyslexia and I got an awful lot of help along the way um, which I'll I suppose I can maybe talk about that later I mean musically speaking I always adored music and actually I think it might have been in a way kind of one of my saviors so I started piano I think when I was about six um, and I learned to read music along the way when I was um, playing the piano and then I started the recorder when I changed schools when I was about nine um, and went on from the recorder to the clarinet when I was 13 when I went to secondary school it's a bit older in the in Ireland you start secondary school at about 12 or 13 um, and also at the age of nine is when I really kind of discovered that I could sing as well. I do recall when I was really young having a small part in a school play, but I don't remember what it was, but I changed schools when I was nine years old. This was also actually thanks to my sister because my mum was looking for a secondary school for my sister. Um, and uh, she decided to get us into this private secondary school. Now private education in Ireland is a different ball game to the UK. It's nowhere near as expensive because it's government subsidized. Um, so an awful lot of people do actually go to private school. Um, so anyway, yes, my sister had to go to secondary school, so they found the school. And actually, in a way, it was another saving grace for me because I ended up going to this junior school when I was nine years old. That actually was a real game changer for me. The main, the first thing was the music. Um, so we had a choir teacher um, and uh, she used to encourage us all to stand up and have a sing. And if we had a decent enough voice and we wanted to, she asked us would we like to go and sing in the local Feshkill and the Feshkill is a music competition in Irish um, so I recall I like, must have been nine or ten singing a song called Somewhere and being incredibly nervous <laughs> but uh, loving it all the same um, so I kind of discovered my singing voice there um, when I was there and uh, yeah so I continued all of those instruments along the way with piano I used to enjoy performing to my grandparents when they came over to see me but only if they were behind closed doors so I would shut the door and I would perform in one room and they would listen in the other room. So um, needless to say, I don't still um, demand that of my audience. I'm happy for them to look at me. But when I was little, that was a bit of a challenge for me. Um, so anyway, up until the age of nine, I was in a common school. Um, you know, there's lots of those in Ireland. It was just your normal state school. Um, and because of my sister starting secondary school, we moved to this school called Alexander College in Dublin. And the thing that was so brilliant about this move for me was that the school was a Froebel, the junior school was taught the Froebel method. Now, it all of a sudden, everything just kind of clicked into place for me and made sense um, because everything in the Froebel method is about kind of um, an all encompassing way of teaching and they use arts and crafts and music and um, play all. Um, so you don't really feel like you're doing specific subjects. So I wouldn't be sitting down to do English, sitting down to do maths. It's an all encompassing way of teaching and there was an off we did an awful lot of art and um visual stuff which was brilliant for me because i'm a visual learner um and at that time when i was in the common school my mom had inquired if i could stay back a year because i was on the young side i'm a summer baby so as a summer baby you're either too old or not too old you're either on the older side or you're a bit too young for school in september so um they wouldn't allow me to stay back in the common school because they felt I was doing fine because I was in the middle of the class. But um, my mum at the time said, well, she felt that I had the ability to do better and she knew her child. And um, unfortunately, they wouldn't listen. But when I moved to Alexander College, I had this wonderful teacher called Mrs. Howe and she was the pr principal of the school. And I was lucky enough that she was also um, my teacher. So after me struggling for a while, I'm not sure if my mother mentioned I was dyslexic when I first arrived. They had a meeting and my mum told her and uh, all of a sudden everything changed. And Mrs. Howe took me under her wing, agreed that I was allowed to stay back the following year. And uh, she kept myself 
and another girl who stayed back after school for an hour every day. And I have to say, Mrs. Howe um, is the reason I'm able to spell. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I can spell nowadays where um, I really, really couldn't at that stage. So she taught me how to spell every day. She spent an hour with me and Pamela um, after school helping us and um, encouraging us along the way. So I had a year of that with her. And one of my proudest moments was um, learning to spell Czechoslovakia, which isn't irrelevant anymore. <laughs> or isn't relevant anymore. <laughs> but in those days, back in the, well, that was the early 90s, Czechoslovakia still existed. So me being able to spell Czechoslovakia was great. Um, and I have to say those three years, I learned so much. The poems that I learned then, which I have majorly struggled with in secondary school, all the English stuff I really diff had a difficult time with. All of that stuff, I remember. I have this block of memory from those three years in the Froebel um, school. And I have to think they were probably the best three years of my education. And um, I think in secondary school, as I went along the way, I didn't really, um, I suppose I didn't recognize that because it's quite hard. You just want to fit in and you just want to do what everyone else is doing the way they learn. So I did really kind of fight against the fact that I should try and find a different method. But actually for me as an old, you know, now that I'm older, wiser, I've spent an awful lot of years learning how to learn because of my job. Um, I can recognize I still look back on those three years and think about the stuff that we did and why it worked for me and why it's so vivid in my memory from my childhood. Um, and definitely the number one reason is because of um, the visual element, because I am 100% a visually led learner. So everything starts with the pictures for me and moves on from then. So I have to start with the pictures and then I've got the oral element, I've got the writing movement, but uh, it's got to start with the pictures. So. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a little bit about my, I think that's my yeah, introduction. Thank you. Yes, that's great, Anna. I, I mean, just fascinating. And the, the story of your background is one that I hear because I, I work with dyslexic students um, and the struggles with reading and writing and the importance of learning through art and music and movement and pictures and also the importance of support from parents. It's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, it, it's parents who really understand that they're, son or daughter isn't stupid but is actually really really capable and your mother was obviously or is obviously that sort of person it's also important for us all to remember that the sort of things that Anna is has already told us and is going to be telling us are important because some of the approaches and key thoughts about dyslexic individuals actually apply to everybody. So good approaches for dyslexic individuals are good approaches um, for everyone. Um, and just briefly before um, I, I let Anna loose again, um, sorry to, to interrupt, um, I should just explain what dyslexia is because there may be some of you listening who aren't quite clear. Uh, earlier I used the word neurodiverse and this is a nice word that emphasises the positive ways of thinking, um, different ways that people process information and do things rather than thinking of dyslexia and other things as disabilities. Uh, there's an umbrella of different conditions that are sometimes called specific learning difficulties or differences, but they're perhaps these days better described as different aspects of neurodiversity. And these include, as you see on the screen, dyslexia, along with dyspraxia, which is also now called developmental coordination disorder, dyscalculia to do with numbers, attention deficit disorder, and the autistic spectrum. These certainly don't have to be disabilities at all. Indeed, the dyslexic mind has many areas of strength, um, and Anna will be, will be talking about this. Dyslexic individuals are often very creative. They may be unconventional thinkers and good at thinking outside the box. As well as Anna, there are many examples of highly successful dyslexic musicians, including Nigel Kennedy that we see here, and uh, Cher, also shown. However, the dyslexic mind may not be at its best when working with words in particular. We don't need to go into the reasons for that right now. Um, dyslexic individuals may also find difficulty with organisation, short term memory, anxiety and poor self-esteem. I'm sure Anna will comment, you know, commenting on some of these areas, Anna. And there is actually another ISM webinar from 2016, uh, which you can also get from the website about music and dyslexia, which goes 
into more detail about what the actual definitions and difficulties and strengths and so on are. And uh, just before I hand over to Anna again, a reminder that there'll be time at the end for questions and you can post questions as the webinar progresses. So back to you, Anna. How do you feel that dyslexia has affected you both for the good and maybe the not so good? Um, yes, well, lots of things to talk about in that area. Um, just want to make a little comment there on what you said, Sally, about people yeah. um, thinking that people are stupid. Yeah. It drives me crazy that that's yeah. still probably a problem that uh, teachers and not I'm not um, saying it's always teachers, teachers and people feel that students that are struggling or whatever are immediately stupid when actually mm. you're just not necessarily teaching the right method for them. Do you know? Absolutely. Um, mm. I don't think I ever felt stupid and I'm really grateful for that. And I think it might be because my mum was such a great support to me. You know, my dad is actually dyslexic as well, but he didn't find out until he actually met my mum and she realised he had a problem too. And I don't know whether that happened um, because of her learning about mine. I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, stupid is definitely not a word because most dyslexics I know are definitely not stupid. <laughs> Um, very intelligent people on the whole and um, really diverse and uh, creative and interesting people um, and the joy of being in music is that there are so many dyslexic people in music and I think lots of musicians don't necessarily like you say don't necessarily want to talk about it lots of people don't want to talk about it mm -hmm. um, and I don't really have any issues talking about it because fundamentally it's part of who I am so anyway, so how does dyslexia affect me in good and bad? Um, the overriding bad point for me with dyslexia is struggling to read and struggling to write in a cohesive manner. Um, with the reading, for me, luckily, I did, never had any issues with the page jumping around or mixing up the letters or stuff like that. It was just the act of reading, the act of trying to comprehend the information on the page and get it into my head so that actually I... Um, took in the information that the book is trying to tell me um, and on the whole my spelling was okay um, probably because I had these wonderful three years with Mrs Howe and she kind of taught me methods to learn that you basically have to learn to spell and lots of people even who aren't dyslexic have to learn to spell it takes effort to learn to spell but some people think it magically happens but luckily spelling wasn't too much of an issue and um, the other major issue was writing so um I mean, I still struggle with, um, my reading's not so bad, but I do still struggle with the writing, trying to get my thoughts into a cohesive manner. And actually, really, for me, the way I write is the way I speak, rather than actually being able to structure your language in a way, in the written word, is in some ways completely different to the way that we speak. And um, I can't, I actually just can't do that, <laughs> um, even after all these years. Luckily, I don't have to do it very often, and I have to say I try and avoid it as best I can which is terrible but true. Um, one of the other things, oh yeah, I was going to say also the, the, the main issue for me about the reading is partly my speed as well as not being able to get the information off the page into my head through that medium. I, I'm quite a slow reader. I mean, I'm faster than I used to be, but when I read something, say my husband sends me an article, an awful lot of articles on COVID at the moment and the science behind it, I say, can you just give me the gist because it's going to take me half an hour to read that whole article that will take you five minutes. I find it completely impossible to scan. I have to read every word. Um, so yeah, and then also because I'm concentrating so hard on actually reading, um, I get really tired and my eyes get really tired. So then I can't process the information even more. So it's kind of like this little circle that goes around and around. Um, yeah, so reading is definitely probably my number one issue and dealing with text on the whole. Um, the other one that you were talking, you were talking about um, dyspraxia. I mean, I'm not dyspraxic, but I definitely have had coordination issues. I had terrible hand eye coordination, and um, trying to um, catch the ball when I was a kid was really embarrassing and kind of impossible. But um, on the whole, the time that I deal with coordination now in my life, because I'm an opera singer, is through dancing and some stage movement that's very specifically um, choreographed, even if it's not a dance. Um, I have to use my brain. I have to work out a way. I will talk about that later. I don't think I have it in my notes, but do remind me um, yeah. if we have time to mention how I deal with the dancing because I've worked out how my brain works in that effect as well. So yeah, they're the main uh, struggles, I think. Um, but from a good perspective, um, definitely the number one thing is the ability to think outside the box and be creative. Um, and uh, you know, if someone says to you, there's, 
you know you have to do something this way I say well I can't do it that way so how am I going to find a way to do it I like I feel like it's brought out and this ability to overcome challenges and to not be as much as you might find it difficult to not be phased or um don't not necessarily don't not to be put off by the fact that you will have challenges because as a dyslexic person I've always had to deal with challenges because it was there from the very beginning of my life so there's plenty of things in life that I find easy we all have our four days but there this struggle that I had to deal with has definitely taught me to be determined maybe to my detriment sometimes but and to overcome challenges um so I generally don't accept no for an answer particularly when it comes to my work situation so if I'm struggling with somebody and somebody says, no, you can't do it that way. I said, okay, well, how can we do it? Have we tried this way? No, that we can't do that way. Okay, well, have we tried that way? And actually, even I find that's really helpful sometimes just being a friend to people because I'm used to thinking and trying to, so if there's a road, there's a wall in front of me, I can't go through the wall. I have to find ways around or over the wall. So I think in a more outside thinking, outside the box, really. I don't think in a straight line. And um, so that's really, really brilliant. Um, yeah, the idea that if I can't find one way to do it, or if I can't find the way to do it, I will find another way to do it. And if I can't find that way, I'll find another way. So I can be a bit of a, a, a pain when it comes to things like that. Um, but that's helped me, I think, in many ways. And actually, I think that might have helped me in my career as a singer and as a musician, because it's incredibly competitive industry to be in. And, uh, you know, I've had this drive and determination behind me that I will succeed and I will come through these things so that's been really great um and uh yeah it has also taught me to work hard and I think my mother says also that that's um as you can see she's had a strong influence on me with my learning and she's still a great help to me um yeah so my mom said that she thought maybe I would have been a little bit lazier if I hadn't had dyslexia and it'd be a bit of last minute, just put it to throw it all together and you'll make it work. Um, so having had dyslexia, it's really taught me to work hard. And I think that that's been really essential as a singer, because the I work, you have to work very hard as a singer and to learn an awful lot of music. And with the repertoire that I sing, I sing an awful lot of Baroque and classical repertoire, um, which is an awful lot of Italian restative, which is difficult and takes a long time to learn. So I'm kind of grateful that dyslexia has taught me to have this um good work ethic and to work hard and if you work hard and prepare you will succeed and um, you just have to put in the hours and actually I think that's a really important yeah one. what about new methods uh Anna oh yes I'm going to move on to that yeah sorry oh, new methods oh yeah so the new method the new methods that I use yes 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 okay I'll move on to that so uh hang on now so you mentioned that you struggle with new methods. Um, oh, yes, sorry. You hated the, yeah. the whole thing about trying to read between the lines. Yes, yeah, of course, sorry. Yeah, so the um, yeah, the weird thing is, so I, I feel like I can think outside the box and I also feel that I'm not daunted by um, certain things that are in front of me. I find them, them challenging, but I do find new methods um, difficult because I've spent so much time learning how my brain works to learn, say, Italian recitative, how to learn music, how to learn opera of, how to learn how to do a dance, that if something's put in front of me and they're requiring me to do a whole new method, I I kind of feel, I feel quite anxious about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to remind myself that actually I have all of these techniques um, that will help me to find the new method to go, to go and to go forward and actually cope with that challenge. Um, and I think that's important and actually really I think it's quite important at the moment with um, the new kind of normal that we're living in we have to find to not be overly daunted and actually go okay we're going to take it back to basics what do I know and how can I achieve what I need to achieve yeah so um, the other thing to do with the reading between the lines um, that's something that I really really struggled with in English at school and with text so like I said it's so difficult for me to comprehend the um, information on the page because the after reading is difficult so even just to get that information to actually then read between the lines go okay well what is this poem talking about I'm like okay well it's talking about a sunflower and it's like well no the sunflower is a representation for something I'm like well, what do you mean this would be my daily challenges of English class when I was school and I really really hated that I found it so difficult to understand poetry and actually mm. you know go past the written word um per se so yeah, so that those are kind of my struggles, my good, and my bad, I think. Um, 
I'm not sure if there's, yeah, other things. So, I mean, it sounds from all those, it sounds quite a stressful situation. Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. It's very stressful. And um, I've definitely experienced all of these things. The embarrassment of not understanding has always, I think, been number one thing for me, not fitting in, yeah, not reading aloud. And, you know, when I think of, when I was going to say, when I think about new methods and trying to do new things, I all of a sudden get all these feelings of stress and anxiety and self-doubt that I had when I was in school. Um, so I feel like because everything when in where I went to school, in secondary school, the education system was all based on reading and writing. For example, um, which I didn't say before to Sally. So in Ireland, we have to learn Irish, the Irish language. I learned Irish from the age of four till 14. I was then exempt from it because I was dyslexic. So I didn't have to use it to count towards getting into university. But to do a language for 10 years, I also did French from the age of nine to 19 and to do another language for 10 years and come out of both of those, but really not knowing very much because it was all taught through writing and reading. Mm -hmm. None of it was taught through oral or images. Um, so I have this deep, uh, not worry, deep anxiety about being in those situations and not comprehending what was going on. Um, and it, it comes back up in me, that feeling of being a child and not understanding. And I feel like all of those self-doubt and anxiety and stress were solidified by my education. Um, you know, our, our journey as a child is so important. And if we can keep it as open and understanding and helpful to the child as possible, it means that they won't go into adult life holding on to these stresses, which I definitely have to cope with still all the time. Um, yeah, so... How do it's you cope? How do you cope? How do I cope? <laughs> Meditation <laughs> when I when I do get the chance. But for me, the thing that has made me cope is um, definitely coming up with strategies. So um, let me tell you a little bit about some of my strategies. And uh, did I talk about? No, I didn't. I'm going to talk about that now. Yeah, um, my strategies and what I've learned and. Uh, yeah. If I have all of these things in place, then my anxiety and my stress doesn't really take over. But the, the number one thing for me is the fact that I am now an adult. I can choose the path that I go on. I don't have to go to English uh, class, to French class, and not understand what's going on. Um, so I can pick something that I'm happy in and that I'm passionate about. And I feel like by finding music um, and the road to music um, meant that the struggles that I've experienced and had to deal with in becoming an opera singer have been possible because I have such a strong passion for what I'm doing that I'm willing to put in the hard work and actually cope with the situation. So I would say to anybody who is dyslexic and is struggling, find something that you love um, and that brings out your strengths and your qualities because then all of the struggles that you have will kind of fall into the background and you'll find a way forward um, with them. So that's how I- Did you always want to go into music? Yeah, so well, so as I told you earlier, I always loved music and I did dream of being an opera singer. Um, I went to see an opera when I was about six. We went to see Marriage of Figaro. You can see this picture of me there actually singing, playing Susanna. Um, I've done, uh, I think, 45 performances in the role of Susanna from Le Nozze di Figaro by Mozart. Um, so yes, my childhood dreams do come true. So I went to see an opera when I was six and I completely fell in love with opera. And I did say to my mum, I really want to be an opera singer then. Um, but as I went through school, even though I had such an amazing musical education and I was involved in school plays, we did Pirates of Penzance was my first, um, I sang Mabel in the Pirates of Penzance when I was 16, my first big deal thing at school. Um, yes, but anyway, in my head, I decided, no, I wanted to be a businesswoman. I was going to run some big firm and I was going to totter around in high heels and wear nice suits and tell people what to do. <laughs> um, and I really struggled to work out what it was that I wanted to study in university, but I was determined to go to university and study something. Um, and my parents had a computer um, software development company. So I was around computers an awful lot growing up and multimedia was just coming into play back then. So it was 2000 that I went to university the first time. And the course I was in, it was a Bachelor of Science in um, multimedia. It was in the communication school in the Dublin City University and it was a really new course. I was only the second year of intake so they were still working out how and what to teach based on that. I mean uh, iPhones hadn't been invented. They were in the making. Most people worked on Blackberries so 
Um, yeah, so it was when I was in music college that iPhones came into play. So that must have been about 2003 or something like that. I can't remember the exact date. So um, it was quite a forefront multimedia, something at the forefront to do. But I thought it was going to be quite practical. I thought it was going to be all about doing, you know, maybe building websites, the artistic side of things. But actually, there was an awful lot to do with communications and the journalistic side of things. And I had to write an awful lot of essays. And needless to say, I was kind of back to square one. Um, so one of the essays I got asked to write was um, multimedia is a science discuss and I was in the library and on this course they had given us in most courses this is the case a huge reading list of stuff that we should read and needless to say I didn't read any of the books because I couldn't <laughs> um, anyway I was in the library trying to do this and I was trying to read a book to try and write this essay which seemed to be quite philosophical which I don't deal with and I thought to myself I you know I'm 20 years of age what on earth am I doing sat here in a library reading a book and trying to write an essay when I've spent my whole childhood struggling against these things it's crazy I'm going why don't I follow my dream which is to be an opera singer I was lucky at the same time I switched singing teachers and my new singing teacher um was really really encouraging and was happy to help me so at that point I decided I would defer my course and try and get um a music degree so I switched paths and um I'm so glad that I did because uh, then all of a sudden these reading and writing issues weren't such a big deal. I had other issues to deal with, but the joy of a music degree is that in a performance degree is that 75% of what you do is performance. So once you can get past your personal journey um, into learning the music or all of that kind of side of things, then you're just performing and having a good time and making music. So um, we had to deal with uh, oral stuff, um, you know, music theory, music history was only a very small percentage of my degree. So I was lucky in that. So I only had to write one or two essays. Um, I did not have to write a thesis because you could choose whether you wanted to write a thesis or not. So instead, I did some music technology and made a film score. Um, and you could have done composition, uh, you did conducting, all of those kind of things. So everything was practical. And all of a sudden, I thought, why on earth am I need to spend my life doing things that are practical? Mm. that uh, take me away from reading and writing and um yeah yeah so, so you you've mentioned quite a bit about reading but obviously yeah. reading and text is a, is a, is an important part of of your life now yeah <laughs> how do you cope with all this text and different languages thank god now i actually have coping mechanisms because when i first started i really did find it very difficult um but because i was passionate about it i did find I, I had a, a way through but um, at the beginning yes yeah. so as an opera singer I would sing in foreign languages um, all the time when I was in university doing my undergrad it was mostly just French German and English I've since sung in Czech Norwegian Irish Russian um, yeah is that it Czech Norwegian Irish Russian French German and Italian I sing in Italian most of the time I should remember that one <laughs> So anyway, when I first started out, the only way I could really learn the foreign languages, I really struggled to um, read the music and the text at the same time. So once I could get the languages away from the written word on into my mouth and into my brain, then it was much easier for me. Um, but it was a real uphill struggle. And the way I coped at the beginning was that I would use the music and I would, in a way, just learn the language like musical syllables. Um, which is not ideal because it's very hard then to actually learn, okay, what am I actually singing about? What do these words mean? How can I communicate this text to this person? Because it, it took me so much effort to actually just learn the syllables with the music. Now, my huge advantage has, for me as a singer has always been the fact that I don't find the music difficult. I've never struggled with it. And I know there's so many different types of dyslexics. I love maths and I think maths and music, reading music go quite strongly together, whereas I really struggled with the literature side of things. So for me, the major uphill struggle was trying to get the text. Um, but I did get lots of help along the way and I have an awful lot of understanding teachers, mostly my um, my singing teacher, Colette McGahan, who took me in my undergrad, was very patient and really, really helped me. And when I, I mean, I did break down in class quite a few times. I recall bawling, crying when someone was asking me, probably something very simple to do with speaking French or changing changing a sound so say instead of air eh, it was uh um for me to actually just change the sound in the context of a class in front of people was really really difficult mm -hmm. because i needed to go away and do it on my own and relearn the sound because i was basically learning by syllables so um yeah that's how i did it so 
Well, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the tools that I have found along the way have helped me. So this is real, um, yeah, where how I start when I get a score, what I do to get to the point where I'm on stage and I can actually sing and perform or copy. So number one thing is move away from the printed text um, and try and find a way that the text means like comes alive for me. So I use images, um, I draw pictures, I uh, translate the text so that I understand it and I can think of it in pictures rather than in the written word. Um, and I do an awful lot of moving around um, as part of my learning process. If I move when I'm learning, all of a sudden the words go into my brain. If I sit here like this, if I was to sit here and try and learn music, I would be stuck here for days and days and days and I wouldn't, it wouldn't go into my head. Whereas if I write the music out for myself and or the words out for myself and I go for a walk and I try and um, speak them to myself. So I'm reading, I'm speaking, I'm not necessarily looking at the page, I'm reciting the words to myself over and over again. The kinesthetic learning takes hold and all of a sudden everything makes sense to me. If I sit still, it's, um, it's kind of impossible really. So I move around and then to start with, I get a score and I mark it up. So I firstly, I will put it into sections. I'll divide the score up. So for an opera, you could do this with a symphony. You could divide it into movements and then you could divide it into subsections. If you were trying to learn a symphony, you could do it in, you know, one bit might be the story of spring, the next of summer or whatever. So what I'm saying is relevant to musicians, not just to opera singers, where we're dealing with text as well. Um, yeah, so I mark up the score. I get my tags. Um, I put the tags in. I have tags for recitative in one color. I've got tags for um, arias in another color, quartets in a different color, so that I, I'm basically making this big thing into as many small little parts as I possibly can. So I feel like I can absorb it. Um, so I mark up the score in sections. I highlight all of the bits that I have to sing. I highlight the whole way through. And I get it from my pencil and I always work in pencil. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll kind of note bash the piece, which means I'm just going to sit at the piano and sing through it and try and see where the musical line goes, get to grips in the musical shape, and then go and sing through it with the pianist. So very often at this stage, my language is far from perfect and I make an awful lot of mistakes, but I try and just forget about that because I know my next level for me is to learn the language. So the first level is to get the musical journey going and to feel the harmony. So if I don't work with the pianist quite early on, I really, really struggle because I only seem to think in my brain in um, melody. I find it very hard to think in harmony. But once I'm singing with the harmony, all of a sudden everything makes sense. But I'm not, I mean, I can play the piano, but I can't do the singing and the learning and play the piano all at the same time to actually, to my benefit. So I have to rehearse with the pianist quite early on. And and you the, talked about the, uh, sorry. You talked about breaking it up into chunks, yeah. and we've got some nice examples here of your spider diagrams. Oh yes, I was going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's all right. So once I've done all the musical side of things, then it's I, I do come to the um the text. Once I've gone through it with the penis, I come to the text, and this is when I have to break it all down. And the spider diagrams are like key to this when I'm trying to learn it all. So the first thing I'll do is I'll write the text in my own written. Uh, hand. So the act, I think, of drawing it off the page through my eyes into my hand and writing it in my own words, all of a sudden I start to feel how the text feels, even though writing is not the most natural thing for me. If I work with pencil and start it, I mean, you can see how awful my handwriting is, but once I get it into my own scrolls, um, it begins to make sense. So I'll start writing it out and then I'll do a spider diagram or a mind map, depending on what you want to call it, of how the story works. It may be that I'm only going to do, say, an aria and a restative on one spider diagram. So I might be that two systems of the music go into one little bit here. This is actually a spider diagram for learning German text off copy, which is not easy. Um, and I'll break it up into, into little chunks and learn it that way. So when I have my written word, I write with a blue and red pen. Hang on, do I have one here? have this little blue and red pencil and it's genius. So I write with the blue when I know what I'm, what I'm trying to write, what I, I, when I know the words and I write with red when I don't. So I'll go through the score, I, the bits that I know I'll write in blue. And when I get to a bit, you can see here that I've say made a mistake or I don't know what the word is, I write it into red. So all of a sudden I have this visual aid. Now I know it's still in the written text because I have to learn the words, but all of a sudden it doesn't look as, 
um, stark to me or as dense as a musical score or even just uh, a reading book. And it's in my own text so I can begin to understand it. And this is the type of piece of paper that I will take on a walk. So I'll take this piece of paper. I know how the music goes in my head because I've learned the music and I'll walk along and I'll try and piece the piece together. And what one of the things I used to find really difficult when I started was that I would start at the beginning, say, of learning a recitative and I would go along and I'd be reciting the text. And then all of a sudden I'd get to a bit and I wouldn't know what the next bit was. And then I would think, oh, my God, I failed. I'd be back down back to my childhood thinking about me not understanding things um and actually what I realized over time was no there was just quite a few holes so what I use with the blue and the red pen is that I try and fill in the holes so then I learn the little hole I spend some time just learning everything in red so I've broken it down even smaller and then I'll join them and actually I use things like if there's say a letter like say something starts with yeah, an I, S, another and, um, example. I don't know whether this is a better example at all uh, no but say something I'll use this sibilance so I'll use the if there's an s in one word say in my blue bit that I know and then there's an s in the middle of the other one I use it so I create these little images and I'll link them up with um circles so that I have a way of linking the holes the bits that I don't know together um so that's kind of how I learn uh restorative I don't know if that kind of makes sense to people um yeah I mean I think I think this whole thing of sort of chunking information or chunking music yeah. into little bits is so important and as teachers we often forget this when we're giving mm. instructions and I mean I've got a bit on the screen here which is a question from a theory exam and there's so many bits in it so it's yeah. really important to so, you know to break it down so this chunking can be applied in so many situations Oh, there's a wonderful mind map. It's really, really helpful mind maps also for learning the plot of operas. Here's Cosi Van Tutte. I mean, I forget the plot of operas until I go into the rehearsal room. Um, and the other thing I spoke about here, going to the rehearsal room is something that's brilliant um, because the movement comes into play. So say the one thing I do struggle with still is learning everybody else's lines before we start rehearsal. So I will know what they're going to talk about, but I cannot remember all of their lines and all of my lines. And when I get into the rehearsal room, all of a sudden the movement takes hold. So the kinesthetic learning, because I have these people around me. So there'll be somebody over there. So I'll move my head to the right when they're saying that line. So all of a sudden I'll remember their line. And then I know this person's on the left. Then I'll remember that line. So this is another thing that people can use. Um, musicians and singers say is to set up in a way your own play in your house. Mm -hmm. Maybe move from room to room, have a flashcard in one room with one color, have a flashcard in another room with another color. Um, and see if you can find a way of kind of creating your own play um, to help you learn the music because then you're you're moving your body and you're not just sat at a piano or playing your clarinet or like me just trying to sing in one spot um yeah so yes uh, I mean absolutely I think all these things that you've been describing um are, are sort of multi-sensory techniques you've emphasized mm -hmm. the kinesthetic you've obviously music is is both oral and oral yeah. um you've emphasized mo m m moving you've emphasized the use of color um yeah. and these are all absolutely wonderful uh, approaches it's great that you're running through this with us all yeah and actually uh, what i was that those pictures of the mind maps even though they're in the written word for me that's actually still a picture in a way and so for someone else they could possibly draw a picture so for each different situation, draw a little, and it yeah. doesn't matter if the picture's any good. Once it's, it makes sense to you, that's, you know, you mightn't be artistic in that way, but if you are great, you could have a whole beautiful Picasso on your page or whatever. Um, <laughs> so here are your, pictures. yeah, here are your coloured pictures. And I, I, I've yeah. also got a, a picture here of a, of a student who's colour coded her music. Um, and, uh, you know, colour doesn't work for everybody, but it clearly no. works for you. That's that's absolutely great. Yeah, and I, but actually mostly red, blue and yellow. So yeah. I will only ever highlight my scores in yellow highlighter. Yeah. Um, and I've tried the other colours, but they just don't uh, work for me. So everyone has to find their own way, you know. Yeah. OK, and um, we, we spoke a little bit earlier about sort of anxiety and stress. Um, and how do you cope with this actually in your professional life? Um, um, I try and take a breath when I'm feeling uh, overwhelmed by something. And I also have to remind myself that actually I am, have done the preparation. And when I turn up to do a rehearsal, I do know what I'm doing. Um, but I think... Also, for me, the important thing has been to actually 
say if you're struggling with something you know don't expect people think you should be able to work miracles because I'm dyslexic immediately if I don't grasp something I think oh god oh god oh god I don't understand I don't understand you have to believe in yourself because someone who isn't dyslexic may not understand also but for some reason I have this little person on my thing saying oh if you don't understand it's because you're dyslexic and actually that's not always the case so you have to really believe in yourself and believe that the work that you've done um and the preparation that you've done and the reason that you're there you've been asked to go there because you're talented and you're creative and people want to hear what you have to say you know and hear what you have to sing or see what you have to play you know um and for me the language thing one of the things like I spoke earlier about this anxiety that's stuck in me a bit like uh, I feel like I'm a child definitely came from learning languages at school and it wasn't until I was in um so I struggled with that all the, even way through my music degree when I was struggling with things trying to I hadn't really found all these methods at that point you know I've really found these as I've become a professional the whole way through and by looking at what other people do. But I um, I was lucky to have one-on-one -on -one German and Italian lessons when I was in Covent Garden on the Young Artists Program. And I thought, you know, I'm terrible at languages. I can't do this. And both of them on separate occasions said to me that I was good at languages. And I, I literally felt like a little child that had won, you know, victory over something because I always felt my whole life that I was terrible at languages and um, they were like no no you just don't you just have to learn your way and both of them were amazing at speaking to me at using visual stuff and we used to I remember with the directions we'd put out a little map on the ground and I'd walk around learning the German di directions and stuff like that so I basically spent over 20 years of my life feeling crap about and having doubts about languages and actually it wasn't the case at all so I would say number one thing is to believe in yourself and know that there are ways you just have to find the right ways for you and it's not always the way that's in front of you it could be to the side yeah i i, yeah. I, have, I have to admit to putting in a tiny picture here of florence foster jenkins oh yes <laughs> not not that i am um, for any for a moment for a single second i'm implying that your voice is anything like hers but she's just such a good example of somebody who she really is. believed in herself she and just oh went God, for it she really did believe in herself. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we've we've got uh, just over ten minutes now. We need, I know. We, Anna. And we, need, we, we need to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, but I think you you spoke to me earlier about sorry about um, kind of the importance of working hard and yeah. I have a little list here of points that I really wanted to make at the end yeah. of this, now that I've rambled on about my experience, um, that would be relevant to teachers probably a bit and mostly to students. Um, so I'm just going to read out the points. Yeah. Um, so firstly, it's important for dyslexics to work hard at whatever we choose to do. And this may be harder than the non-dyslexic, but it'll be worth at the end because you'll find the right path for you. Um, if you're struggling at something, stop. Observe yourself and work out why you're finding it difficult. Break it down, like I've spoken about, chunk it. Create a realistic plan um, of how you can get to the end with the method that's our best for you, rather than just saying to yourself that you can't, because you can do it. You just have to find the right way. Um, be inquisitive um, about your mind and become a friend with it. Um, I kind of feel like I've made friends with my dyslexia over the years, and I've nurtured it, and I've found the best tools that help me through these difficult things that I struggle with. Um, being dyslexic definitely brings some mental challenges that aren't always rational and I suffer with great a great deal of frustration um, about the things that I'm slow about and this is where I think teachers can be really supportive and um, teachers can encourage their students to take the time that they need and like you say bring things down into really really small things so that the path becomes clear and you don't feel like you can't kind of climb this mountain that you can do it um, I would say that it's very important to try new things and ideas and even if you don't know that they're going to work at least if you tried then you might actually find a new method for yourself so I when I'm out working and I see other singers trying to learn music or trying to learn text or whatever I actually go over and I say oh well what are you doing there how are you learning that and I see that they might have a different idea that's worth me trying because if you constantly try new things about your learning you might find a whole thing that actually is brilliant and I wouldn't know where nowhere near be where I am now today if I hadn't have tried lots of things to see how I learn best you know um Did never you, be yeah. afraid to say that you don't I, I was just going to ask you about asking questions oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah never this is a big one never be afraid to say that you don't understand um ask um 
say, you know, isn't me, but I don't really understand what you're trying to say. People would much prefer that you asked and therefore understood what they were saying, then stood there and pretended that you knew what you were saying, but actually you don't. And then you'll fully understand what's going on and you'll be able to um, do what they ask you to do. And I've really had to take this into my heart because when I'm in rehearsal rooms, sometimes directors tend to be very well read, which I'm not because I'm not great at reading and use very big words to describe things. So I've learned an awful lot of adjectives in my time as an opera singer because directors have used them. And uh, I'm like, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I just ask now. And I don't care anymore if people think, you know, oh, she's being stupid because most of the, nobody thinks that you're stupid. You're just asking a question, you know? So it's really important to ask. Find what you're passionate about um, and have a natural fair, flair for, because then you will um, enjoy what you're doing and you'll find the journey. And listen to the people around you, listen to your parents and your mentors, and they are inquisitive too. And they're really trying to understand what works best for you. So try and work with them. Cause I, I did push against a lot of people when I felt like, I wasn't getting somewhere and I think that's really important. Um, yeah, so most importantly, make friends with your dyslexia and eventually you'll, over the course of your lifetime, work out how your brain works and become friends with your neurodiverse brain. <laughs> yes, I mean, that, that, that those points are all um, absolutely wonderful, thank you. Um, you asked me to remind you about dancing. Oh yes, yeah, so the dancing, yes, quickly I'll talk about that because I know we're running out of time. See, I always talk too much. So oh, no. the dancing for me, what I realized um, when I first had to do some proper coordinated dance in an opera was that I can only learn dancing if I'm behind the person. So if someone is mirroring me, I can't learn the dance. I have to be looking at their back and following from behind on the right hand side to learn the dance. If I go to the left hand side, it will work for me and I won't remember it and I can't coordinate it. And then I have to slowly break the dance down. So if I can do it one way, they'll say, oh, do it that way go to the right and do it and then go to the left and do it. And I said, well, okay, well, I can only do it going to the right because to go to the left, I have to learn it all a different way from my brain because the left-right connection is slightly off. So um, I have to do the same thing and break down the dance. But most importantly, if they're facing you and that doesn't work for you, then ask them to turn around and go the other way. So I would follow the choreographer around the room behind them. And that's the only way that I can learn how to dance. So um, that can be relevant to lots of people, even in gym or something like step class. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I mean, I think the whole point that, you know, one of the crucial things that you you've been talking about is finding different ways of doing things. Yeah. And I came across this the other day, which is such a good yeah. maxim for us all to remember, particularly teachers, so that if people don't learn the way that we teach, then we need to teach the way people learn. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's exactly what what you've been talking about. Um, I don't know whether we'll have time to to, ha to have any thoughts about the arts in the immediate future, but maybe, I mean, it's, it's about eight minutes to four. I don't know, Maria, whether you'd like to take any questions, Anna, to take any questions now. Um, hello, yes, uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, we do have some questions, so it would be nice to, to get, Anna, to get your thoughts on on some of them. We might not have time to, to tackle all of them. Um, and then I'll, I'll attempt to to uh, send them to you both and we can we can deal with some that we don't manage to no answer. Yeah, can I, can I just uh, say I've, I've put up on the screen here some links, uh, both for Anna and also for BDA Music. There's our email address here. So if people don't have time to answer questions, if anybody wishes to email BDA Music Dyslexia or, of course, email the ISM, they will, we can pass questions on to Anna. So thanks, Maria. No problem. Um, okay, so some of these questions are really interesting. We've got someone asking about sight reading. Um, mm. Do you have any any coping mechanisms or anything? How do you deal with sight reading? Um, so sight reading, yeah, I had to learn to sight read basically because um, I became a choral scholar and I couldn't sight read at all. And I learned by sight reading along with the harmony, like I said, when it was in the harmony, I understood it an awful lot better. So I found just reading one line of music on its own, I, I couldn't necessarily find the connections between the notes. Um, so when I had the harmonic structure, I could actually use my internal musician um, and trust myself that actually I did know where my voice was going rather than not. But um, I'm not uh, the best person to answer this question because I don't struggle massively with the music side of things. For me, it's the language and the physical side of things and the written word. Um, 
yeah so I think with sight reading I think actually you do just have to practice a lot but I think all of the stuff that I've spoken about like if you break it down say for instance there was you know all of the f sharps in the key of d major that you circled them with a red pen as you go through um making like the triads really obvious to yourself so say you know the d f sharp a maybe circling them around linking them together so you um, break down the music into chunks and actually work out what the harmonic structure is by using colors that makes it so it's you're not just looking at um this density of the score for me about everything if it's all really really black i can't focus so if you can try and add the colors and break it down um that will probably help but um as i said i'm not an expert on that side <laughs> can i can i just pop in very quickly there to point out that it is actually legal um it is okay to photocopy music uh for the purposes of making it easier for for example a dyslexic person to read as long as you have the original in your possession and if you look on the music publishers association website it's actually clause 11 and it, it does specifically talk about that so it can be quite useful to photocopy a piece uh, and as as Anna says, then to maybe colour code it or mark up sections. Sorry. Possibly yeah. enlarge the piece. Yeah. Make it bigger. Yeah. Mm, sure. Great. Thank you very much. Um, someone else is asking about do you um, let the opera company know that you're dyslexic? And no. if so, have you experienced any hostility or lack of understanding or anything like that? Um, no, well, I don't. I mean, it doesn't really come up. My job as a singer is to turn up knowing the music and being able to sing. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, but I do kind of bring it up like in certain circumstances, like when I'm trying to learn a dance or whatever, and I might be struggling or they might feel that I'm a bit slow. Well, I feel that I'm a bit slow. I will say I was like, oh, I just need a bit more time for this. And it does come up often in rehearsal where you've learned something off by heart. Actually, the muscles are remembering it for you rather than necessarily your brain, which is brilliant because then you're just into this kind of um, parasympathetic nervous system and it's all just flowing. And that's the joy of being a performer. But it means I find it very hard to make changes once I'm in that state. So I will say, you know, to the conductor, um, I'm really sorry, but I'm struggling with this. You're going to have to give me a few days to reprocess it, basically. Um, yes, which is something that I do. Um, but I've never, luckily, I've never experienced any hostility. That's what I love about the music business. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Um, how do you um, learn so much so quickly? How do you cope with learning so much music so quickly? Um, so I'm a, re I, I'm a really big planner. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's really important to plan your time, very um, break everything down and actually look at the music. So say I'll get all the scores out for that year and be like, okay, well, how much, look through them all and work at how much is actually involved in each score because every score has a different challenge. Um, sometimes it means starting in the middle of a score at a really difficult patch rather than necessarily going from the beginning to the end um, and planning like up to two years ahead, which is relevant for singers. Um, so that I know the stuff that's going to take a long time has, I have time to learn it. So for instance, I might start something for a year from now, now do an awful lot of work on it now, break it down. I may not learn it completely off copy, but there's an awful lot in it that I've learned and then come back to it a few months before. And I find that actually my body has learned an awful lot of the music and sleeping on it. Um, I've processed an awful lot of information when I come back to doing the score again. So I think planning is really important. Great, thank you. I, th I think some of the questions are kind of repeating themselves and I feel like we've we've definitely touched on um, on most of the questions in, in the I presentation. Know somebody, sorry, Maria, I know somebody no, no. Asked, asked earlier about what strengths has Anna found in being a neurodiverse singer? Oh, well, as I said, I did kind of cover a lot of them, but yeah. I, mean, I think one of, the, one of the big strengths is, um, I suppose, that I really have the music and the text on it really deeply learnt because I can't wing it. I have to, it's got to be really deep inside my body, which I think means that I feel it means that I can be an even better actress and an even better musician and actually go with the flow when I'm in the performance mode. So for me, once I get to that stage, I've done all the hard work. Um, and I feel like it's my strength that I, I don't ever turn up unprepared because I have to be prepared so that I can um, be adaptive in the situation. Um, and also all those things, which is to do with struggles and working hard and um, thinking outside the box and coming up with new ideas, which is brilliant when you're working with a director. They'll say, oh, can you do this? And I'm like, well, what about this? This might work. And actually bouncing ideas off each other and being creative in that way is something that I find is, is a gift, really. Right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's that's about um, time. Um, 
it's been really interesting hearing about your experience and talking to both of you. Thank you again for agreeing to, to do this presentation. Um, any questions we haven't got to, I'll pass them on to Ali, uh, Hannah, sorry, and Sally, and uh, we'll attempt to answer as thank much you. as well, well, possible. Thank you very much. Thanks to the ISM for inviting us and a, a huge <laughs> thanks to you, Anna. Oh no, I'm delighted. I'm really happy and I hope that people um, have learned something about me and the way that I learn and if it's maybe spurred some ideas for them and um, but please feel free to contact me on social media or um through the ISM or the BDA and I'm more than happy to ask questions as an ambassador for the BDA I don't do a huge amount except be here for people if they want to ask questions and um I'm not an expert but I'm an expert in me and uh <laughs> if I can help you great Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much to all of you for attending. Uh, I hope you found it really helpful and we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.